Welcome to a Legendarium special about the history of potatoes and mashed potatoes. In this installment, we will talk about the potatoes' journey from the Andean Mountains in South America to Europe and eventually to Thanksgiving tables across the United States. Humans first domesticated potatoes in the Andes Mountains of Peru and northwest Bolivia as far back as 8000 BC. These early potatoes looked very different from the potatoes we know today. They came in a variety of shapes and sizes, and had a bitter taste that no amount of cooking could remove. Potatoes also had slight toxicity, so wild llamas licked clay before eating them. The toxins in the potatoes stuck to the clay particles, allowing the llamas to eat them safely. People in the Andes noticed this and started dunking their potatoes in a mixture of clay and water. While not an appetizing gray it provided an ingenious solution to their potato problem. Even today, when selective breeding has made most potatoes safe to eat, some poisonous varieties can still be bought in Andean markets, sold alongside digestion-aiding clay dust. During the rise and reign of the Incan Empire, Incan farmers bred nutrient-rich potatoes into a fully edible plant. Since many potatoes could be grown on small plots and provided much nutrition relative to space, they became ideal for a working class which built terraced farms and royal roads and didn't have time to farm. Spanish explorers brought the first potatoes to Europe from South America in the 16th century. However, European farmers grew suspicious of plants not mentioned in the Bible and that did not grow from seeds, like sensible crops. Strange prejudices aside, potatoes tended to remain small when grown in Europe even after months in the soil, which made them less attractive to farmers and landowners. The Spanish solved this problem by growing potatoes on the Canary Islands, a middle ground between equatorial South America and northerly European climes. Europeans struggling to adjust to the changing climate of the Little Ice Age slowly accepted the spots, yet some remained fearful of an unbiblical tuber. In the Scottish Highlands, farmers purified the tubers by planting potatoes only on Good Friday and then sprinkling them with holy water. Others feared that potatoes caused leprosy, perhaps a punishment for eating unholy food. Yet a handful of potato advocates turned the potato's image around. During the Seven Years' War of the mid-1700s, a French army pharmacist named Antoine Augustine Parmentier became a prisoner of Prussian soldiers. As a prisoner, his captors gave him a choice between potatoes or starvation. He chose potatoes. In France, this would qualify as dire cruelty, for Frenchmen thought of potatoes as feed for livestock. Indeed, the French passed a law against humans eating them in 1748. Yet, as Parmentier discovered in prison, potatoes not only did not cause death or leprosy, but could sustain human life, and were quite tasty too. Following his release at the end of the war, the pharmacist proselytized his countrymen about the wonders of the tuber. To do so, he demonstrated all the ways it could be served, including mashed. By 1772, France lifted its potato ban. Potatoes became a key part of an agricultural revolution which expanded crop yields across the continent. That meant Europe ceased to suffer from periodic famines caused by grain failures and freed up some people from farm work to live and work in cities instead. In her 18th century recipe book, The Art of Cookery, English author Hannah Glass instructed readers to boil potatoes, peel them, put them into a saucepan, and mash them up with milk, butter, and salt. In the United States, Mary Randolph published another recipe for mashed potatoes in The Virginia Housewife. It called for half an ounce of butter and a tablespoon of milk for a pound of potatoes. However, no country embraced the potato like Ireland. 
The hearty, nutrient-dense foods seem tailor-made for the island's harsh winters and could be grown on small plots, a necessity for the Irish as English landlords claimed the best land for themselves. Irish people often preferred their potatoes mashed, often with cabbage or kale, in a dish called coal cannon. More than a staple food there, potatoes became part of Irish identity. Experiments with industrial drying geared up towards the end of the 1700s. In an 1802 letter, Thomas Jefferson wrote of a new invention which grated potatoes and pressed the juices out, creating a cake that could be kept for years. When rehydrated, it became like mashed potatoes, according to Jefferson. Sadly, the potatoes often turned into purple, astringent-tasting cakes, which proved unpopular. One other thing that slowed down the march of mashed potatoes was that housewives traditionally used rounded pounders called potato mashers, which took much time and energy. Around the beginning of the 20th century, a new tool called a ricer started appearing in home kitchens. A metal device that resembles an oversized garlic press, and it has nothing to do with making rice. When cooked, potatoes get squeezed through the tiny holes in the bottom of the press. They are transformed into fine rice-sized pieces. The process is a lot less cumbersome than using an old-fashioned masher and releases gelatinized starches from the plant cells. They glom together to form a paste-like consistency. During the Second World War, several countries experimented with freeze-drying potatoes, but only made soggy mush. Yet during the 1950s, researchers at the Eastern Regional Research Center outside Philadelphia developed a new method for dehydrating potatoes. This created potato flakes that could be quickly rehydrated at home. Soon after, instant mashed potatoes hit supermarket shelves. In a way, this revived an Incan technique of freezing dry potatoes with a combination of hard labor and natural mountain cold. The Incans gave it to soldiers on duty and used it to guard against crop shortages. Today, rehydrated mashed potatoes can be made with butter, cream, fresh herbs, spices, minced vegetables, or grated cheese to give different flavors and consistencies, each of which are welcome on any Thanksgiving table. That wraps things up for this episode of The Legendarium. I hope you enjoyed it. If you did, press like. If you want to see more, press subscribe. And if you've got anything to say, let me know in the comments section. Thanks again for joining me, and I hope that you have a great rest of the day.